joining us from the UK, India, and beyond. Uh, first of all, I'd request my uh, panelists to please switch so, their mics throughout the uh, webinar. I'd love to. On behalf of FIKI and Energy Systems Catapult, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on decarbonization through battery energy storage systems. Unfortunately, my colleague, Mr. Vikram Kotru, is unable to join us today due to unforeseen circumstances, but I'll be represented, uh, representing Fiki in his place. My name is Sheetal Rana, and I work as a research associate with the Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainability team here at Fiki. We are thrilled to bring together a distinguished panel of experts, innovators, and stakeholders from both India and the UK to explore the immense opportunities for collaboration in the battery energy storage sector. Battery energy storage systems are crucial to, the adva uh, to advancing the clean energy transition, particularly as India targets 500 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2030, and the UK progresses with initiatives like the Longer Duration Energy Storage Program. Today's discussion will highlight the regular, uh, regularity frameworks, technological advancements, and market trends shaping the future of battery energy storage systems, aiming to foster innovation and accelerate our joint efforts to decarbonize the economy. I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed speakers for today, starting off with Ms. Babita Sharma, Senior Advisor, Net Zero Science and Innovation Network from British High Commission. Dr. Anjali Jain, Senior Manager, Energy from Niti Aayog. Dr. Rahul Valawalkar, Chairman, India Energy Storage Alliance. Mr. S uh, Surya Chaudhary, Chief Renew uh, Re uh, Revenue Officer, Utility Business, joining from Ampin Energy Transition. Dr. Daniel Morant, Practice Manager, Networks and Energy Storage from Energy S uh, Systems Catapult. And lastly, we have Mr. Daniel Matthews, Director of Engineering, from Lena Energy. I'm also joined by my colleague, Mr. George Tay, Senior Advisor, Net Zero Policy at Energy Systems Catapult, our co-organizer for the event today. Over to you, George. Thanks very much, Sheetal. Um, yes, uh, uh, we're delighted also to be working with Vicky on bringing this uh, webinar together. I'm just going to say a few very quick words Firstly, uh, just to br very briefly introduce the Energy Systems Catapult. Uh, we're an independent research and technology organization based here in Birmingham in the UK. And our mission is to accelerate net zero energy innovation. So we're all about innovation in the clean energy space. We were launched in 2015 by Innovate UK, the, the UK government body. We built a team of about uh, 250 people with a wide range of technical engineering, consumer, commercial, incubation, digital and policy expertise. And we have sector leading uh, test facilities, modeling tools and research capabilities. And we aim to work uh, in close collaboration with innovators across the clean energy space. Um, the innovation, uh, the innovating for transport and energy systems program Program, which this uh, this uh, webinar is part of, uh, is a partnership that we've been working on uh, over the last 18 months or so with uh, innovators and partners in India. And we're aiming to um, promote collaboration to enable innovators to, to enter the uh, amazing uh, uh, Indian market and uh, uh, take advantage of the opportunities, bring together expertise, set up pilot projects, test new business models, and promote collaboration across the clean energy space. Um, and this, uh, this webinar is one of a series of knowledge webinars where we're aiming to promote uh, partnerships, knowledge exchange, and make connections uh, between these two very important countries in the uh, clean energy transition globally. Um, Okay, I think that's enough from, from me. I'll uh, I'll hand back to Sheetal to to introduce the uh, the rest of the program. Thanks, George. Uh, we will begin with just a moment. Uh, 
I'll hand over to Ms. Babita Sharma from British High Commission to deliver her keynote address and set the context for today's webinar. Ms. Sharma, over to you. Thanks, Sheetal. I hope everyone is able to hear me. I'm really sorry my camera is off because I'm traveling for another meeting. Uh, but uh, keeping my apologies in place very quickly, I'll just let everyone know that I work with ITIS, specifically Energy System Catapults a lot, because this is one of the pillars of the Net Zero Center, which I lead on at the British High Commission. So just to give an all around um, overview on the net zero center we have three pillars one being itis i'm not going to talk much about it because i know you guys are either already aware of it or there's going to be a separate presentation the second pillar is decarbonizing pharmaceuticals which is between um, uh, center of processing innovation uh, in uk and ncl which is national chemical laboratories in india together they've started um, a living lab uh, so that's the second pillar and the third pillar is basically all about hydrogen. So we're doing partnerships in, in the area of hydrogens between UK and India, especially with universities like University of Birmingham. And from India side, we have um, HPCL uh, and partners uh, like uh, Principal Scientific Advisors Office when it comes to hydrogen in itself. Um, just this much about um, uh, Net Zero Center, but if we come back to the topic again, I'm not going to go into very much details because we have distinguished speakers uh, who will already speak about um, uh, energy storage systems in detail. But just to give an idea, uh, energy storage systems are technologies that store energy for later use, such as when it's in surplus or demand is low. So uh, energy system storages are important for several reasons, which can be including grid stability, uh, which can be about renewable energy or green energy. And some of the common types of energy uh, storage systems are battery energy storage systems, and then uh, which basically means use of batteries to store electricity, which can then be released when needed. Battery energy storage systems can be installed on a user's premises or directly connected to the power grid. Then we also, um, uh, there's another type of common energy storage system, which is hydrogen, uh, which is hydrogen electrolysis, uh, the process which uses surplus electricity to produce hydrogen gas, which is then stored. And then again, when needed, the process can be reversed to produce electricity from the stored hydrogen. We also have super capacitors, uh, which basically means... Um, we can actually have electrochemical devices store energy by collecting electric charges on electrodes. Uh, very quickly on the facts, uh, I think India's recent energy land, uh, storage landscape report uh, said that India's cumulative installed battery energy storage system capacity is 219.1 megawatt hours. Chhattisgarh, surprisingly, uh, is, accounts for about 54.8% of the cumulative installed capacity. And uh, solar PV systems combined with battery energy storage systems accounted for 90.6% of total installed capacity. And when we talk about UK, the battery storage industry is world leading uh, with a total capacity of 4.4 gigawatts, second only to US, which is, I think, 15.5 gigawatts. Um, and UK's battery energy storage systems project develops are being very ambitious and they have a uh, plans right now, I think for about 95.6 gigawatts, which is just rapidly increase from about 50.3 gigawatts a year ago. Uh, there is a combined, I think, 4.3 gigawatt of capacity under construction currently, and another 30.4 gigawatt um, uh, in the pipeline. Uh, and then there is a lot which has been already submitted for planning permissions uh, uh, for different stages of development. Keeping the facts aside, I think I'm going to talk majorly also about uh, what role energy storage can play when it comes to fighting climate change uh, and global adapt, uh, global adoption of clean energy grids. So replacing fossil fuel-based power generation with power generation from wind and solar resources is basically the key strategy for decarbonizing electricity. So storage enables electricity systems to remain in balance despite variation in winds and solar availability, allowing for cost-effective deep decarbonization while maintaining um, uh, the electricity supply. So there are about six points that I'm going to discuss. One being um, storage enables deep decarbonization of electricity systems. So energy storage is a potential substitute for 
uh, almost every aspect of power system, including generation, transmission, and demand flexibility. Storage should be co-optimized with clean generation transmission systems and strategies to reward consumers to make their electri electricity use more flexible. Uh, the second major point is that we need to recognize trade-offs between zero and net zero emissions. So goals that aim for zero emissions are more complex um, and actually are also more expensive than net zero goals that use negative emissions technologies to achieve a reduction of 100%. The pursuit of a zero rather than net zero goal for the electric system should be result uh, sh could result in high electricity costs that make it harder to achieve economy-wide net zero emissions by 2050 for India, which is 2070. The third point is developing economy countries are an important market for electricity system. I'm not going to go deeper into it because I know we will be talking about markets and projects, but uh, just so that you know that developing economies like India is the market that we're looking for. Um, the, the other point is that we need to invest in resources and leg regulatory agency staff, which is again very important uh, because we need to co-optimize storage with other elements of electricity systems coupled with certain climate change impacts on uh, demand and supply and uh, all the necessary advances in an analytical tools to uh, have sufficient plans and then operate and regulate power systems for the future. Long duration storage needs government support. As we all know, battery energy storage systems is accelerating rapidly, but then these lithium, lithium ion batteries um, are not basically idle for long duration storage. Um, these batteries have and will likely continue to have relatively high cost as well for electricity stored, making them unsuitable for longer duration storage. So uh, this is this is an area where we need a lot of support from the government. And obviously, rewards will always help. So reward consumers for more flexible electricity use. So uh, whether it's wind or solar generation, the goal of decarbonizing other sectors through electric electrification increases the benefit of ad adopting pricing and load management options that again will reward customers for shifting electricity uses with some flexi flexible ways uh, from periods when the balance between supply and demand is tight. Um, so I think that's majorly what I wanted to talk about when we talk about um, energy uh, storage systems in terms of net zero and climate change. I will pass on to Sheetal again. I hope it was helpful. And thank you so much. And I'm really sorry for switching off my camera again. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sharma, for setting the stage for today's discussion. Uh, now we move over to our second segment, that is role of uh, energy storage systems in energy transition, policy exchange, and market opportunities. Uh, we have Dr. Anjali Jain from Niti Aayog. Over to you, Ms. Uh, Jain. Yeah, thank you, Sheetal. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me here. Uh, inviting me here. Um, I would like uh, to start my talk uh, with the current scenario, what is happening in India uh, regarding the decarbonization of energy sector and particularly the power sector and the transport sector where uh, battery energy storage is gaining the traction. Then I would like to talk about some uh, regulatory and the policy uh, interventions that the government of India is taking currently. And then finally, I would like to talk about the Niti Aayog, uh, what, what exactly Niti Aayog is doing for the uh, uh, energy transition and decarbonization of the whole economy of the country. So uh, in India currently, there are two major sectors uh, where battery energy storage is gaining traction. In power sector, uh, India's battery energy storage capacity is still at the nascent stage with install capacity even lesser than the one gigawatt hour. However, as we are uh, 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 planning for the more and more RD penetration for the decarbonization of the power sector, the requirement of storage will increase to provide the 24 cross 7 reliable power. Because as we all know that uh, renewable energy, which is like have huge potential in India, uh, solar and wind have some um, in inherent current, uh, characteristic of intermittency. So if we are planning to phase out our coal power plant or phase down our coal power plant in future, there will be a requirement of 24 cross 7 power, which either can be met by the nuclear uh, uh, capacity expansion, 
which again have some constraints of high gestation period, requirement of huge land, requirement of huge uh, uh, safety zone area. So uh, um, the second option is uh, integrating the renewable where uh, uh, the support is only battery energy storage or I would say the energy storage, uh, which currently uh, can be made by the pumped hydro storage or the battery energy storage. Um, the optimal capacity mix report of uh, uh, released by the Central Electricity Authority of India estimated a requirement of approximately 40 to 50 gigawatt of battery energy storage uh, by 2030 in their various scenario to support the grid with approximately 500 gigawatt of RE by 2030. Uh, there are few projects which are currently at the planning stage in India. Uh, like NTPC is developing a huge capacity of a storage project in Ladakh to provide stability to the grid and enhance the region's renewable capacity potential. Uh, currently, Seki has also um, floated tenders for the BESs integrated with the renewable projects, reflecting growing uh, interest in hybrid systems. Uh, Niti Aayog has conducted one study for the renew uh, how much state uh, has to uh, contribute in the renewable uh, capacity expansion to uh, meet their renewable purchase obligation by 2030. And in that report, uh, Niti Aayog has uh, uh, estimated the requirement of 65 gigawatt of storage by 2030, which includes 45 gigawatt from BESS with five hour duration and 19 gigawatt of pumped hydro energy storage. Um, Indian government has also announced or has taken several measures for promotion of energy storage like inclusion in harmonized list of the infrastructure production link incentives um, pli scheme i would say where the scheme provides the establishment of manufacturing facility for the advanced uh, chemistry cell batteries uh, that aims to develop 50 gigawatt hour of ba domestic battery storage manufacturing capacity then government is uh, government of india has also announced viability gap funding for the battery energy storage that aims to reduce the levelized cost of storage to 5.5 to 6.5 from the 10 rupees per unit. Then uh, there are energy storage obligations also listed in with the renewable purchase obligation notification. Uh, there are other schemes like waiver of interstate transmission uh, uh, transmission uh, charges for the storage, uh, <coughs> like the green open access uh, uh, rules are there. Um, in transport sector also, we have a uh, national mission on transport, uh, transformative uh, mobility and battery storage prom uh, promotion in, in uh, that promotes the in indigenous manufacturing and adoption of battery energy storage. Uh, Central Electricity Authority is also working on the regulatory framework to support grid scale storage projects, including mandates for the renewable energy storage. Um, some states have also listed a uh, few targets for uh, um, hybrid um, projects that aims to um, have capacity installation of solar, wind, and uh, along with the storage of, of installation in the project. And Seki has also uh, uh, announced few uh, tenders for uh, these kind of hybrid projects. However, few challenges still uh, exist with the penetration or the uh, huge uh, deployment of energy storage first is a high cost which is like a, uh, bet as battery energy storage is still expensive compared to traditional storage like the pumped hydro um, though we are uh, expecting that the price will decline rapidly and we can uh, have like a, a commercial viability of the storage projects also then in India there are still lack of business models for uh, energy storage system there are few regulatory hurdles like integration of uh, energy storage into grid operation requires changes in the regulatory framework. Uh, currently in um, India, what happens? Uh, it is dominated by the uh, electricity market is dominated by the fixed tariff, which do not provide incentive for the uh, deployment of the energy storage system. So framework like uh, changes in the grid code or um, enabling the uh, or facilitating the ancillary service market in the electricity market of India or providing um, a, a different kind of uh, tariff mechanism for the frequency regulation, peak shaving and renewable energy integration that facilities can be provided by the battery energy storage can support its integration. 
uh, one more major challenge for the india's clean energy transition is the availability of the finance Uh, various studies of uh, uh, various research studies have put investment requirement for the net zero uh, energy transition of india um, that ranges uh, uh, about like a, a dollar 10 to 14 trillion by 2070 uh, in comparison to the current investment level which stands at uh, approximately dollar 44 billion per annum leaving a significant financial gap 83% of track financial flow in financial uh, year 20 uh, came from the domestic source with only 17% from the international sources so uh, there is a huge um, um, requirement of the climate finance for the um, energy transition in india if i talk about the future outlook of energy storage in india energy storage market is expected to uh, grow significantly as a major element of the country's decarbonization strategy as a um, currently a major element of the decarbonization strategy uh, uh, is demand electrification currently from the 19% demand electrification india is expected to have um, demand electrification of all economy sector uh, more than 40% by 2047 and uh, to achieve net zero of whole economy uh, power sector decarbonization has to occur before 2070 and because the only option for the power sector decarbonization currently in india is to penetrate the renewable um, that cannot be that cannot happen without the support of the energy storage so uh, there is huge potential of uh, energy storage in india further from the uh, if i would say there are some other applications also like uh, um, india have its green hydrogen mission or green ammonia um, uh, uh, application where uh, because green ammonia production required 24 cross 7 hydrogen requirement hydrogen supply and green hydrogen can be produced only we have uh, a renewable capacity along with the storage support so there is another application other than the electricity generation the uh, production of the green hydrogen also required the support of the storage for the renewable energy um some other emerging trends like distributed energy storage where battery energy storage can be deployed in behind the meter application in commercial industrial sector vehicle to grid solution um finally i would like to talk about the on uh, what niti aayog is uh, doing currently so niti aayog as an apex uh, policy uh, body uh, policy think tank of government of india has um currently has undertaken the task of developing an integrated net zero roadmap for the india where it will examine the various aspect of the transition so for that niti aayog has formulated six interministerial group to develop a wide stakeholder concerns um that six groups are a uh, macroeconomic group which will examine the implications of net zero pathway on the macroeconomic uh, parameters like gdp uh, current uh, 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 account deficit fiscal deficit and all a uh, second group is about the sectoral uh, analysis where the uh, committee will uh, analyze the pathways for the decarbonization of major five sectors like uh, transport industry building agriculture and the power then the third group is about the climate finance uh, which will examine the requirement of the money for this transition and the source of the money whether it will be uh, um, um through the domestic market or through the international market and what exactly is the source of the money then fourth group is about the r&d domestic uh, manufacturing and supply chain of all the critical and emerging clean energy technology along with the critical minerals fifth group is about the social aspects of energy transition and the sixth group is about the policy synthesis so this is the interministerial group which is being formed by the niti ayo where energy storage will also uh, have a major uh, role because in a uh, few sectors like trans uh, transport power sector and industry sector the energy storage will definitely play a huge role and in the uh, uh, group uh, of the r&d manufacturing and the supply chain requirement um one of the technology is battery energy storage i hope is, this information is definitely uh, uh, benefited the uh, talk how the collaboration and the other work can happen yeah thank you thank you thank you dr anjali a lot is happening in the energy uh, storage sector now to dr rahul 
to uh, let our participants know about the market opportunities, the role uh, ESS has to play in the energy transition. Over to you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you very much, Sheetal. I hope uh, everyone can see the screen. Yes, we can see the screen. Sure. So uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Piki uh, for uh, inviting IESA for uh, this uh, interesting uh, uh, roundtable. Uh, so as the India Energy Storage Alliance was formed in 2012 for creating awareness about advanced energy storage and e-mobility technologies in India, and since then, we have made our vision to make India a global hub for R&D, manufacturing, and adoption of advanced energy storage technologies. And we have close to 190 members and additional 30 plus partners uh, from 15 plus countries. And uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, membership uh, uh, spans uh, all uh, parts of the uh, ecosystem. Uh, IESA works on four uh, verticals. So there is one which is stationary energy storage, uh, which focuses on application of energy storage for uh, renewable integration, for grid applications, for uh, behind the meter applications, for especially commercial industrial customers, as well as for microgrids and mini grids for energy access. Uh, the India Electric Mobility Council focuses on uh, e-mobility, EV manufacturing, EV component manufacturing, EV charging infrastructure, as well as battery swapping. Uh, the battery manufacturing and supply chain focuses on the giga factories in India as well as associated ecosystem, not just for lithium-ion batteries, but for all the emerging and niche technologies as well. And then India Green, Green Hydrogen Council looks at synergies between electrochemical storage, uh, mechanical storage, and green hydrogen ecosystem, and try to see how we can learn from uh, some of the learnings from our last 10 decades of policy advocacy related to energy storage for making sure that we achieve some of the ambitious goals what the uh, government is setting for green hydrogen transition. Now again, uh, energy storage have, uh, uh, can be deployed at different scales at different locations. So uh, at kilowatt scale, it can be at household level, at megawatt scale, it could be at industries or uh, at uh, distribution substation, uh, at uh, hundreds of megawatt scale, it can be part of transmission or even at gigawatt scale, it can be a part of the solution for uh, optimizing generation. Um, there are num multiple uh, use cases in terms of integrating it with uh, RE generators or even with uh, uh, conventional generators. Uh, we are seeing now uh, many traditional thermal plants are uh, having to back down to uh, uh, almost 40% of its uh, 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 rated capacity uh, uh, because of variability in the load and uh, other renewable generation. Uh, so you can even uh, look at uh, integrating storage uh, with thermal uh, assets as well. Uh, it can definitely be used for optimizing transmission and distribution infrastructure, where there are many transmission lines where in India have uh, utilization factor of less than 20% because these are all uh, getting built for future uh, uh, growth. Uh, but then if you are relying on primarily just renewable energy, then the utilization factor is going to be below 30%. Uh, uh, the system operators are looking at storage for grid balancing and already uh, CERC has issued certain regulations for creating a groundwork for ancillary services through energy storage. Uh, various discoms have started now exploring uh, use of storage for optimizing distribution uh, investments as well as uh, uh, providing certain services to the customers and we are seeing a lot of uh, activities happening around uh, India. And then obviously, I think we think end users uh, uh, are also going to be driving this sector. We are seeking, uh, looking at centers like uh, 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 data centers have started to adopt RE plus storage uh, as part of their RE100 roadmap uh, on a large scale already in India. And we expect that as uh, more and more domestic manufacturing will come up and prices are coming down, uh, we will see actually rapid adoption in uh, many use segments where traditionally they were just using lead acid batteries for uh, backup, uh, but now with advanced batteries, they can actually uh, integrate these batteries with renewables for decarbonizing uh, uh, or uh, meeting some of their uh, uh, RE100 or decarbonization targets over the next decade. Uh, now, one of the reasons why the prices uh, uh, are coming down is global manufacturing is scaling up. And what we have seen just in actually last one year, there has been substantial 
uh, drop in prices, especially uh, uh, due to uh, uh, significant dumping happening from China. And we do expect that as global manufacturing capacity keeps on scaling up, uh, uh, we will see this trend continuing. And then again, sodium ion batteries also have uh, just started uh, uh, getting commercialized. Uh, uh, and uh, we do expect that uh, by 2030, they could be also a, a good alternative for stationary storage uh, in certain applications. Uh, now, in terms of the India policy thing, uh, 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 Anjali ji already talked a lot about it, so I won't uh, repeat things, but uh, uh, as IESA, we are working with almost uh, 10 plus ministries, uh, as well as with Niti Aayog on uh, various aspects related to energy storage. And we are happy that various agencies, including MNRE, uh, Ministry of Power, uh, uh, Niti Aayog, CERC, CA, all of them are taking uh, various steps uh, uh, for removing barriers for enabling storage. And this journey has been happening over last 10 years. And now we are also seeing significant activity happening at individual mm -hmm. states uh, for integrating energy storage as part of their RE policies. Uh, in terms of the overall development, I think the national framework for promoting energy storage system is now issued by Ministry of Power. Uh, there are guidelines for pump storage projects is also uh, laid out. Uh, as Anjali mentioned, viability gap funding for 4 gigawatt hour is already approved by cabinet, although the actual disbursement of that has not yet started happening. Uh, and then resource adequacy framework by CEA, uh, that also is uh, laying out a very clear roadmap for annual addition of energy storage at different level. Uh, in terms of various tenders, we are seeing sort of a, a steady progression and learning. Uh, the, we think that the current format of both standalone as well as FDRE, which is uh, firm and dispatchable renewables, are very good frameworks. Uh, although we keep on hearing about round-the-clock tenders as well, uh, but we do think given the kind of uh, uh, variability which is there in the load, uh, right now we don't see too much requirement from most of the discoms or customers for round-the-clock uh, uh, RE plus storage power, but uh, even like using four hour or six hour storage and uh, uh, shifting uh, renewable power and making sure that it is available during the peak time, uh, which is a model for FDRE, uh, that itself I think is uh, sufficient for at least next three to four years. And we expect a lot more tenders to come in in uh, uh, that format. Um, right now there are more than uh, 13 gigawatt uh, uh, FDRE tenders are issued. There is additional nine gigawatt hour of uh, standalone ESS tenders are also issued. So we do expect uh, that uh, within next two years, India will uh, start getting featured amongst the top three countries globally in terms of uh, BSS uh, deployment. Um, uh, also simultaneously, uh, pump tidro is also... <laughs> Sorry, uh, pump hydro is something which is also uh, uh, getting support and uh, uh, especially companies like Greenco, which is a, a leadership circle member of IESA, has uh, done a lot of uh, interesting work in uh, uh, trying to fast track the pump hydro development because traditionally around the globe as well as in India, pump hydro projects have taken anywhere from 15 to 20 years to get built. Uh, so that was a, a significant issue for pumped hydro, but by uh, doing some innovative work in looking at off-river uh, pumped hydro sites and uh, doing significant work in identifying such sites, Greenco is expecting to get these projects operational within three years, uh, which will be almost a Guinness record uh, uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, now, here are just... Uh, summary of various projects and tenders uh, during different stages. So some are operational, which are smaller projects. Uh, some projects are currently under bidding uh, and under construction, uh, and some are still at tendering stage. But you can see that totally there is more than almost uh, uh, 15 gigawatt hour of storage tenders, which are uh, currently in different stages. If you want to get more details on this, uh, India Energy Storage Alliance uh, maintains a, a comprehensive database of all these tenders and uh, details about each of the tenders which you can get access to in the members resource section on uh, IndiaESA.info website. Um, in terms of the uh, policy uh, uh, gaps, I think we uh, do welcome the announcement related to energy storage obligation, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a 
uh, uh, significant delay in operationalizing the energy storage obligation and there is that ambiguity which is creating some challenges similarly the viability gap funding it generated a lot of interest but it has been now almost uh, uh, year year and a half since it was announced but there is no operationalization of that so that has also uh, caused some delays of certain tenders which got cancelled uh, after vgf was announced so that's an unintended consequence of having supportive policies uh, on ancillary services, again, uh, the CERC has issued the new grid regulations in 23 as well as the ancillary service regulations, which allows energy storage to participate. But at the same time, in terms of creating a transparent price signal as well as assurity about the dispatch, uh, there are still some work and fine tuning which is required. So IESA is regularly interacting with CERC on that. Uh, uh, and then uh, firm and dispatchable RE is, I think, the way forward. Uh, in terms of going ahead, uh, we, we do expect there is still some require, work required in terms of access and duty reduction, uh, especially for non-lithium-ion battery technologies because currently lithium-ion batteries have 18% GST, but other technologies are uh, at 28% GST. So IESA advocates that all storage technologies need to have similar uh, GST uh, treatment as it is provided for other renewables, which is at 5%. Uh, uh, in terms of the timelines for various projects, that is uh, very crucial because I think in terms of the announcements and tenders, uh, we are doing much, much better. Uh, but the biggest hurdle for industry over the last five years has been cancellation or delays of many of these tenders. So we have urged Niti Aayog as well as uh, uh, Ministry of Power and MNRE uh, to set up a committee to try to monitor these timelines and make sure that we don't uh, have these delays. Uh, or around the world, energy storage is recognized as a Swiss knife where it can provide multiple services to the grid. Uh, unfortunately, the current set of tenders which are there in India, except for maybe a couple of tenders at state level, are mainly valuing energy storage only for the energy arbitrage or peak shifting application, and other services are not really getting valued. So uh, that is another reason why there is a slight delay in uh, getting some of these projects off ground. Uh, instead of just waiting for uh, uh, manufacturing price reduction, we need to make sure that uh, uh, these projects are allowed to capture all the value streams which energy storage brings to the table uh, and that will allow uh, 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 much larger deployment even at the current prices. Uh, we are asking for very clear target setting because like what has happened with solar and other renewables, uh, we see that once not just a 30 or 5 year or 10 year target, but uh, a very clear annual roadmap, which is uh, uh, released as part of the target setting that gives uh, industry significant confidence. And that is the work which is currently pending. Uh, and we need to look at that. Uh, so last uh, but not the least, uh, as Anjali ji mentioned, uh, Niti Aayog drafted the ACC PLI scheme, which is currently being implemented by Ministry of Heavy Industry, and that has generated lots of interest in domestic manufacturing. IESA has been advocating for domestic manufacturing since 2015 and has worked very closely with the uh, Niti Aayog team in framing the ACC PLI. Uh, and we see that thanks to the PLI uh, and uh, related work which has happened, uh, now IESA has actually set the vision of not just 50 gigawatt hour, but uh, India to get to 550 gigawatt hour of domestic manufacturing by 2035. So basically using the PLI as a uh, the founding stone and then uh, going ahead and uh, to at least 140 gigawatt hour manufacturing capacity by 2030 and 550 plus gigawatt hour by uh, 2035. Along with that, ISA is also working on uh, creating robust supply chain, domestic supply chain for uh, materials and uh, uh, intermediate process materials. And there we would love to explore any opportunity to collaborate also with UK, uh, where India can become a supply chain uh, hub for some of the giga, giga factories coming up in uh, uh, for Europe, especially in UK, uh, for uh, both lithium as well as sodium or other alternate technologies. I think there is a lot of expo uh, export potential available. And as IESA, uh, we are happy to collaborate with UK and uh, other partners uh, for bringing the industry collaborations forward. So with this, again, I'd like to thank Sheetal for opportunity to share these uh, insights. And both mine and Devi Dash, who is the uh, executive director and president of IESA, our contact details are here on slide. And I'll be happy to share the slides if it helps. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you so much for the presentation. Now we'll be moving uh, 
forward to our next segment that is insights from the UK strategies and innovations in energy storage systems. I'll request Dr. Daniel Murant to please. Hi everyone. Uh, sorry, just bear with me. All right, brilliant. Hi everyone. Yes, I'm uh, Dan Morant. Hopefully you can you can hear me okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, energy storage in the UK both now and where where it may have to get to uh, by by 2050. Uh, first of all, how much energy storage does the UK have, and how much may may it need? So here, to just focusing on kind of electricity uh, energy storage for a minute. Although we'll we'll kind of expand that uh, on, on some of the next slides. Uh, in 2023, we had 3.5 gigawatts uh, of battery storage, uh, and that was down under 2 gigawatts only sort of a year, 18 months before that. So, so already a sort of uh, large increase. Uh, and then we had 2.8 gigawatts or 28 gigawatt hours of uh, what, we, what we've termed as thermomechanical storage. At the moment, that's nearly entirely all pumped hydro storage. So that's uh, large existing sites that have been been in the system for, for uh, you know, Many years, although it is expected that more will come online, uh, you know, in the in the following following years, uh, and then in terms of where we may have to get to in twenty fifty, uh, you know, the future is not certain. It does depend on what kind of scenario you you look at. But uh, based on some scenarios from both ourselves and the UK's uh, national grid, the the transmission grid operator, uh, you're looking at potentially up to thirty five gigawatts, uh, sixty five gigawatt hours of battery storage. And then 15 gigawatts, 203 gigawatt hours of, of thermomechanical storage. And really, rather than the kind of uh, core numbers, I think it's the it's the scale of change that's needed. So, so you know, that's uh, substantially over a kind of tenfold increase, uh, both in batteries and and thermomechanical storage that we we need to, to get to. Uh, so I guess the first question is, is why? Why do we need uh, that, that much storage? Uh, so as we move to, to net zero and to, to decarbonize, uh, increasingly sectors are, are electrifying. So transport, uh, you know, traditionally uh, petrol, oil, et cetera, uh, is, is increasingly moving to, to uh, electric vehicles, battery powered vehicles, uh, and they, they need charging. So there's a bigger, bigger net demand. Uh, also in the UK, the system is increasingly moving to be to being dominated by, by wind energy. So that means there's less and less gaseous uh, generation and and storage on the system so today we get around uh it seems to change all, all the time depending on kind of what sites are, are operational at any given moment but you know low tens of terawatt hours of of uh, gaseous based storage so so a significant amount of storage and that can be used uh you know for for heating but also for, for powering gas turbines so, so essentially as uh electricity storage so so as we lose that and as we move to a uh, renewables, uh, wind-dominated system with, with higher electricity demand, there will be uh, not only periods when that wind is not available, but the, the demand will potentially be considerably higher. So we need uh, more and more storage to uh, uh, fill fill those gaps. Uh, and that is that is partly going to be kind of uh, pure electrical storage, so battery or, or, or the kind of thermomechanical stuff, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, in a minute, but also uh, building scale thermal, thermal energy storage. So this could be as simple as as our hot water tanks, uh, or it could be it could be uh, more more novel uh, technologies uh, such as such as phase change materials. Uh, but essentially, what uh, in the UK uh, a large part of our, our peak demand is, is driven by by the need for, for for heat, particularly in the in the winter. So having thermal storage and being able to shift that peak is is uh, potentially quite quite valuable. Uh, and then focusing uh, on on the kind of breakdown of that for for. Uh, uh, a little bit, uh, we can see that the batteries have a significant role. Now we should say this is gigawatt hours, so this is storage volume, and that tends to favour the uh, you know the longer duration technologies because they can store more energy. So that's not to say that there isn't a significant amount of batteries, but the, the you know the total volume they are storing is is less. If we looked at this in terms of just power, so so gigawatts rather than gigawatt hours, we would see you know a, a higher proportion of of batteries. So so we have batteries in there. Uh, generally operating on that kind of shorter shorter duration period. Uh, we have pumped hydro, and then at, at the moment, I kind of best guess is that will be supplemented by compressed air energy storage and, and liquid air energy storage. Uh, I think it's fair to say that that kind of medium duration period, uh, there's, there's still you know, lots of innovation to be done to see which which technologies kind of uh, win out, but at the moment, they, they very much look like the, the, the front runners. 
and then thermal storage again operating over a period of uh you know a few hours maybe to slightly more hours you know five six seven perhaps uh but, but certainly probably not over over multiple days uh and then in terms of what that that storage is is doing i just wanted to show this uh very quickly which has come from some recent work we've done for uh the uk government's department for, for energy and net zero and without going into too much detail, essentially for each network level, but this, this focuses on the transmission level, we were trying to look at what services required and what technologies could provide them. And I guess what I really wanted to draw from this is that there are lots of services that, that need uh, you know, flexibility service, that need storage or other forms of flexibility. And there are lots of technologies that, that can provide them. Uh, once you start looking over all the network levels of behind the meter, you actually end up with over kind of a thousand individual combinations. Uh, and the point is, there's no single technology or single vector that will be able to meet all the services at all the network levels that are uh, needed. Uh, so, so it's about having a, a balanced and mixed kind of portfolio of energy storage and, and flexibility technologies. And then just to dive into some of them kind of more core ones uh, from that kind of broader set, uh, you've got sort of general uh, within day balancing of renewables, uh, which will be electricity based, quite uh, you know probably probably batteries. Uh, and that can be things like fast demand response. So, uh, you know, if there's a sudden shift, either in uh, a sudden increase in demand or a sudden uh, drop in in uh, generation, then you know, being able to manage that uh, very very quickly. And similarly, reserve over a period of hours. You wouldn't expect batteries to be providing reserve, you know, for a sustained period for you know, days, but for a, a first few hours after that kind of unexpected event has happened, they, they've very much got a got a role to play. Uh, and then also peak, peak shifting. So, so we, I'll share a chart in a minute that kind of shows the, the sort of daily variation in UK demand and, and how we can shift that that peak away uh, to, to lower the sort of net or, or yeah, maximum kind of generation capacity that is, is required and then obviously lowering lowering costs. Uh, again, heat heat storage, uh, so, so peak shifting, uh, so very much part of that, that within day. Uh, and then again, peak shifting potentially, uh, you know, hours, uh, Again, within day, uh, EV smart charging will have a real role to, to play in that. Uh, we've again, I'll talk about it a little bit more, uh, but we've seen significant uh, potential to, to reduce demand through uh, smart smart charging. Uh, then you get into sort of balancing, uh, but over over a period of a day or, or you know, several days. Uh, and again, that will be electricity storage, but maybe your your sort of longer duration stuff, so the pumped hydro, liquid air. Uh, redox flow batteries as well, you know, very much in there, although although they were kind of classed as batteries uh, uh, earlier. And then the the final one, which I haven't really talked about, but I do think it's important just to, to kind of raise, is uh, seasonal peak demand. So the uh, UK energy demand is very seasonally based because it's driven by that heat demand in the, the winter. Uh, uh, and, and having a system that A, can respond to that kind of increase over the whole, the whole season, but also that is there for kind of, uh, you know, Contingency for market shocks, uh, you know, for for, for resilience, uh, because that's going to involve storing lots of energy for a long time, and perhaps not using it very often. Maybe only using it for a few weeks a month in in, in winter. Maybe even storing some of it for for a few years. Uh, you know, that really can only be kind of gas based. Uh, obviously, natural gas uh, would you know wouldn't wouldn't meet our, our kind of emissions targets. So it's a hydrogen uh, or uh, a kind of derivative of hydrogen uh, again looks like a a likely option, but I guess the the, the real key message for me here is uh, that there is no single solution. There's lots of roles that we need energy storage and flexibility to provide, and there's not a one size fits all solution to that. So we need to have that kind of uh, you know range of of technologies. Uh, and then yeah, just coming back to a little bit more detail about that that kind of role of storage. So this is uh, some example kind of modelling we've done. Uh, and essentially that black line is the uh, demand. So these are free lots of uh, uh, free day periods. So uh, essentially each kind of vertical line is, is a 12 hour period. So you've got a morning peak, slightly higher wind, uh, evening peak, and then it kind of repeats. Uh, and we have we have three periods. So we have a winter and a summer, and then we have a peak period, which is essentially winter, uh, slightly colder than an average winter demand, but with lower renewables. Uh, and essentially what you can see are batteries have a role, you know, nearly every day cycling uh, daily. So charging uh, when demand is lower and then, you know, helping to meet that that peak. Uh, and then those longer duration uh, electricity based technologies, uh, they're not needed all the time. They come in for, for longer periods, often when it's, uh, uh, you know, 
colder, uh, or, or essentially demand is higher, but that, that often means colder. Uh, so that's kind of when when they they come in. Uh, and then again, I talked a little bit about you know the role for uh, smart charging. So I just wanted to to show some of our our analysis on this. So this is just for for twenty thirty five. But essentially, we think uh, that you know peak demand can be decreased by as much as seven percent uh, in a system where you've got smart charging compared to one that that isn't. So that means rather than uh, you know you come home and you charge your electric vehicle uh, as soon as you get home or whenever it's convenient to you, uh, you charge it uh, probably driven by price signals, but you charge it at a time when uh, essentially generation is high compared to demand. Uh, so, for example, in the UK at the moment, we already have tariffs where during the kind of middle of the night, you, you get a cheaper rate for, for charging. Uh, but they are looking at, at more dynamic tariffs. So it's more based on the kind of, uh, you know, hourly uh, difference between kind of generation and and demand. Uh, and just, just two more slides for me. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about policy in the very last slide. But again, wanted to show some of our modelling around the kind of role of, of thermal energy storage and again very very similar to, to batteries in, in the kind of uh operational period uh, albeit less required during during summer months uh but but yes yeah, so so contributing to meeting demand during uh those those kind of peak periods uh and then charging uh uh during during the kind of lower lower demand uh times so i believe this is showing a little bit about why why the uk needs uh energy storage and the kind of you know uh, really good progress that's being made already and, and will hopefully continue to be to be made uh but i just wanted to show a final slide on what you know what what can what, what can be done to kind of uh you know continue continue with that progress so uh some of the some of the barriers that we that we face in the uk is a lack of sufficiently kind of granular uh operational signals both in terms of time and, and location so you don't need flexibility uh, to the same degree everywhere, and obviously not at the same the same time. So, how do we have price signals that really incentivise uh, flexibility when we need it, and really sort of values that our you know ability to shift demand at different periods and also in different different locations? Uh, I, I think this is more perhaps for long duration energy storage, although, although maybe to an extent across the board, but but still limited investment signals. So we we know that energy storage is needed. We know there's a a kind of role for it. But that doesn't always uh, uh, translate into uh, you know uh, in, in an investable situation. So how do we how do we kind of change that? Uh, and then thinking more about kind of customers, uh, you know, there is an option for for both domestic and kind of commercial customers to provide flexibility. Uh, but particularly on the domestic side, they're often locked out by by the kind of regulation. Uh, so uh, you know they they either don't have the sort of digital uh, infrastructure. Or they they can't kind of play on the right kind of market. So how do we how do we change that? Uh, and then you know in terms of, of some of the things we may we may do, and these aren't all necessarily directly linked to these barriers, but, but planning reform we, we know in the UK you know we just can't build the stuff that we need quick enough. Uh, that, so, so, so how can we kind of streamline that planning process? Uh, locational pricing. So this comes back to that that point around uh, you know having the, the signals that are that are granular enough. So. You know, there isn't actually a need for, for flexibility to the same level across the whole country. How do we how do we reflect the fact that that's that's different? Uh, and then I I won't go through all of these, but I suppose the final one for, for me is, is digitalization. Uh, you know, so much of this flexibility that we need, uh, particularly on the kind of uh, consumer uh, you know, domestic side, although not not limited to that, is going to need digitalization so that we understand. Uh, you know, when our flexibility is needed, where it's needed, make sure we get that signal out to people in terms of a kind of price signal. Uh, so, so yeah, I believe digitalization will be will be kind of really really important. Uh, so I that that that's me done. So I kind of uh, wrap up now and, and pass on to to, to Daniel. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure we'll have time for any questions at, at the end. Hello guys, thank you, uh, thank you for taking time to to join the webinar today and uh, to give me a chance to uh, discuss our pilot project. So, I'm uh, essentially uh, coming from uh, Lancaster uh, in the UK. Um, this is uh, Lena HQ. Um, we've uh, we are a, a, a basically a business here. Um, I can uh, just share my screen for the um, for the webinar. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, um, just on this, so uh, I want to basically discuss some of the 
uh, some of the pilot projects that we've had uh, basically through uh, the energy catapult systems and uh, basically talk about some of the uh, some of the successes and some of the opportunities that we've seen out of this but um, basically just giving a background into leaner energy uh, we are a, basically a, a, an inventor and a, uh, a manufacturer of solid state sodium metal chloride cells um, this is building on um, 1980s zebra chemistry batteries and these are basically been um, modernized with new fuel cell ceramics so we uh, we we print uh, ceramics onto a cost effective uh, steel supported electrolyte uh, this basically allows us to put this into a planar cell um, but one of the key areas that we uh, we see here is obviously that we are using conflict free minerals um, so there's no cobalt there's no uh, very little nickel all that type of stuff in there that uh, basically allows us to uh, be very cost effective in uh, in the market um, but also be a, a key um, a key opportunity a key um, sorry um, a key differential uh, when it comes to uh, different batteries in the in the actual uh, in the market so we've we've got a very resilient system design um, we operate we're a hot battery so we're totally different to lithium ion uh, in the sense that we uh, we operate at 250 degrees we have a very wide operating range but we can basically operate in the environments between minus 25 degrees and plus 55 uh, and we have a, a cell uh, round trip efficiency of, of more than 94 percent again uh, leading into a, a, a system RT, which is again ab above 93%, which is uh, very, uh, very attractive in the market. But one of the key areas that we've actually tailored this cell for is for long duration energy storage. Now, a lot's been discussed in the past uh, in this uh, in this presentation about how you know long duration energy storage is, is vital moving forward in peak shifting, um, and we focus that for for ourselves as being one of the market uh, key market areas for us to actually target. Now, this uh, this cell essentially has been tailored between four and eight hours duration um, and allows us to really target that uh, that that uh, peak shifting element of the of a system so you know with uh, a lot of the discussions that we've had previously just in this uh, in this discussion now um, we're looking at how you know there's a high proportion of base load from coal and gas uh, in the in the global in the global market you know this is moving towards a global elders demand um, you know renewables are supplementing the core uh, supply, um, but we will get to the point where we'll have uh, oversupply in certain areas in the day, especially with solar. Um, you know, we've seen this in uh, areas such as um, uh, California, uh, where they're actually having oversupply and be able to be able to peak shift this uh, over to uh, areas in the day. Um, but you know, there is basically still a need for other areas in the in the, in the overall generation ecosystem. So lithium will you know, dominate the short term, uh, but there will be uh, requirements for uh, long duration energy storage for sure. So looking at this, obviously, we move towards um, uh, an area where we are tailored towards long dur duration energy storage um, from, you know, uh, utilizing four to eight hours, uh, specifically with solar generation. And as you can see, you know, we're anticipating solar generation to uh, to increase, you know, incre increasingly uh, over the years through from uh, 3.8 terawatt hours by 2030, um, especially in India or China regions, um, where we can see a massive increases uh, across those areas, you know, and specifically these areas uh, are, are hot. Um, so that allows us to operate in these areas where lithium currently has a significant uh, throttle bottleneck, really, with uh, temperature um, reliability. Um, so, you know, we can uh, come at, at this with a, a significant um, efficiency increase, especially on the RTE. So uh, with that market fit, obviously, we've uh, we've developed uh, a system and we did a pilot project, which, you know, took a long time for us to uh, to get through to uh, fruition. But this started back in uh, 2022 with um, an MOU signing with uh, Leaner Energy and Social Alpha. Um, Social Alpha was a, an incubator. Uh, set up with the uh, uh, Indian government and basically this was uh, supported through other corporate entities such as Tata Power. Uh, but you can see here we also signed, uh, I think this was last year, we signed a, uh, an agreement to uh, bring in some um, some uh, pilot projects for uh, through Tata Power specifically and this was in conjunction with the um, with the catapult system and ITES uh, to basically uh, to, to deliver this or some uh, joint funding uh, between India and the UK. So this was a, uh, a 10 kilowatt hour solid state sodium battery. Um, it basically, this is a minimum viable product uh, just to basically uh, showcase the system. It was installed in the Tata Smart Grid Lab in, uh, in Delhi. And uh, this was uh, a photo taken recently um, after the uh, successful pilot. 
um, but we we did a, a multiple phase delivery from January through to uh, through to August this year, and uh, actually deployed uh, energy from and uh, to the grid as well. So you know, there's uh, there's been a few challenges that we uh, we found along the way, but ultimately, you know, uh, one of them was mainly logistics, shipping from the UK to uh, India. Uh, there's very much uh, you know. Um, some barriers there. It's definitely when it comes to uh, shipping uh, batteries. Uh, we had uh, obviously a lot of uh, dangerous goods um, negotiations to, uh, sorry, uh, basically to, to move through, which was, you know, very, uh, very challenging for us. We found a lot of uh, areas where, you know, we, we wouldn't have been able to do this, um, you know, on our own, uh, specifically at the size we are as a company. Um, but the infrastructure we found, you know, we, there's a, a lot of grid instability and network instability when we were actually um, deploying this. Um, you know, the network instability mainly in and around the uh, communications to and from the UK, you know, um, being able to actually monitor this remotely per, and provide uh, a, a good basis for data acquisition as well. Um, but then when it moves through to, uh, you know, the us as a company, you know, we had to scale out of our labs. We had to make something of a, uh, a decent uh, scale. And, you know, we had to actually start making batteries on a, a consistent basis and putting them into a pilot project, which was going to go into an end user. We phased our SAT uh, to obviously de-risk and uh, look, keep hold of the scope. Um, but ultimately, there has uh, been a, a lot of benefits from getting our batteries onto uh, Indian soil, obviously deploying them as soon as possible and then phasing the uh, the the capacity expansion from that point. Um, and then obviously the challenge is just the speed of business. As, I, as I've already mentioned, we we started these discussions early in 2022. They take a long time to to develop and nurture. And, you know, I'm, hopefully I'm not um, teaching people to suck eggs here when, you know, it's uh, it's all relationship based and, you know, trying to find our um, trying to find our feet in the uh, in the Indian markets. You know, it couldn't have been done without the uh, without the traction that we made early on and uh, supporting, uh, um, obviously, other businesses supporting us all the way through. So, you know, we got we got a lot of benefits from uh, from doing this pilot project. Ultimately, um, our, we, got, we got a lot of credibility and integrity. You know, we got our foot in the door in a key market with a key market leader in Tata Power. Um, but also, you know, we got onto the Indian market, which we've uh, highlighted as a, as a key area for us to, uh, to target, especially with, you know, the large generation of solar in the future, the large emphasis on uh, battery storage and being a, uh, you know, alternative solution to lithium ion in the, the Eldes market. Um, giving us, you know, this global presence as well, specifically when we're looking at these hotter regions where lithium iron will be uh, will be throttled by the ambient conditions around it. So, you know, it, it definitely uh, a proof of product to market fit uh, for us um, in the Indian market, and it was uh, a key area for us there. But not only that, we got, uh, you know, we got a competitive advantage by being able to uh, to deploy this um, specifically with uh, with with Tata Power, who are crucially looking into uh, the generation of uh, battery storage. Um, not only that, we were able to, you know, uh, leverage. Um, local partners, stakeholders that can facilitate future expansions. So this opened a lot of doors. Being able to uh, to be in and around uh, the the basic the uh, basically the, in the in the situations where we're able to to talk about what our projects are, what our ambitions are for scale for manufacture, um, to look at the joint possibilities of uh, doing this on uh, and both in the UK and in uh, in India. And you know we're able to continue our commercial relationships with Tata. So it was very, uh, very fruitful there uh, in terms of the benefits. But lessons learned, definitely, you know, logistical uh, elements of this were, were difficult, um, along with, uh, you know, uh, being able to ship from the UK to uh, to the, to India. And, you know, through the help of the Catapult, we were able to leverage uh, local logistics partners and they, and they were crucial for us uh, within in the India region. Um, you know, they're able to alleviate a lot of bureaucracy when it comes to uh, customs, you know, both imports and when we're looking to bring it back now, uh, the export of those batteries back to the UK. Um, understanding those cultural nuances, you know, is, uh, is very specific for us. You know, we, we, we actually had to have somebody go to the, the customs and, and discuss, uh, you know, the release of the, the batteries and, um, you know, make it uh, a lot more seamless through to delivery. Um, again, you know, de-risking the whole situation. We had a, a phase delivery approach. You know, we we installed uh, one battery pack, and you know, this included the systems, testing the systems to and from the UK, uh, and then we increased the uh, capacity throughout. But not only that, it allows us to set the expectations for 
for the stakeholders, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of companies when they sign MOUs don't necessarily deliver, um, and you know it's more mainly just for marketing or uh, uh, a ploy to um, you know to showcase that you know something has been signed. But it's crucial that you deliver, and you know that credibility and integrity that comes with that um, really was uh, focused in on um, our phase delivery. Um, again, not uh, necessarily stating the obvious, but you know, understanding the business culture is key. Uh, UK India, you know, relationship based um, and hierarchical respect was definitely emphasised throughout. Negotiations can be lengthy, um, but you know, we we put a lot of weight and um, you know, we we relished a lot of the uh, the benefits that came out of that. Taking you know, um, and a real good understanding of the the key business environment around us was uh, was was really key to to making this a success. And, you know, not only that, it gave us a lot of opportunities to uh, move on. The credibility gave us to look at larger scale projects, you know, so we're looking at 100 kilowatt hours and beyond. Um, you can see in the, on the photo here, we're, we're looking into uh, containerized systems. And not only that, we can start looking at manufacturing opportunities, uh, specifically in the India region to help us on our scalability and uh, cost down reductions. And again, moving into uh, additional commercial agreements and additional funding possibilities um, with, uh, with, with big organizations and, uh, you know, corporates that were a key to, to making this a success. So again, thank you for uh, taking some time to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to listen to me on the, on the discussion here. I hope you've got uh, any questions. I can uh, answer them at the end for you as well. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are running slightly behind schedule. I'll have to rush to the next segment, Indian Industry Insights, Current ESS Projects and Future Opportunities. Over to you, Mr. Chaudhary. Um, I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Uh, thanks, Sheetal. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, good morning to my fellow panelists from uh, the UK. Uh, some very interesting insights uh, shared by uh, my fan uh, panelists, and I am here to uh, give a, a, a overview of the industry uh, insights and how uh, they shape up in terms of uh, the overall uh, uh, market size uh, right now and future uh, uh, growth opportunities. Uh, hello everybody, I am Shaurya Chaudhary and I am representing Ampen Energy Transition. So just to give you a brief uh, background, we are one of the uh, leading renewable energy IPPs in the country and uh, as on date we have a 4 gigawatt peak uh, balance portfolio across uh, commercial industrial as well as uh, utility customers. Wing 70 customers across uh, uh, different uh, sectors, uh, close to about uh, 10 sectors and uh, 21 states uh, in the uh, nation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, from a uh, industry outlook perspective, so uh, we as a country have uh, already committed to increase our share of non-fossil fuel uh, generation source uh, to 40% uh, by 2030. Now, what does that translate into? It necessitates uh, necessitates a demand for flexibility in power systems and uh, that's where uh, ESS uh, comes into play because uh, that's going to be uh, the uh, crucial role in increasing systems overall flex flexibility by serving multiple grid applications. Now, uh, I'll, I'll additionally with increasing electricity demand, uh, flexibility in terms of end applications, flexibility in terms of location also uh, becomes key. And uh, that's where energy uh, storage system comes in because it shifts energy from one time period to another time period, thereby increasing the value of energy stored. Now, if we look at uh, the use cases uh, of uh, stationary energy storage systems, as uh, has already been mentioned, uh, so one use case is the wholesale uh, market. Then we have the ancillary services. Uh, we also have behind the meter as well as uh, the TND system. Now, uh, moving on, uh, talking about the opportunity, uh, if we look at it, uh, obviously, we it is a well-established fact that uh, the uh, RE proliferation has to be uh, complemented by uh, simultaneous growth in uh, ESS capacity. India as a country uh, will need at least uh, close to 42 gigawatt or 210 gigawatt hour of BSS in uh, FY 2930. 
to meet a, a four-hour peak power replacement, we are uh, looking at a 1.5 uh, uh, terawatt hour ESS by 2030, which is when we are looking at a 500 gigawatt of RE. Also, if we look at uh, how the market uh, uh, has grown itself, uh, we'll see an explosive growth from about 10% uh, in the overall uh, tendering uh, pie uh, in uh, 2020 to uh, 30% uh, and about 46% in this particular uh, ongoing uh, financial year. Uh, it, it, it goes without saying that the decreasing battery costs have certainly helped in boosting that adoption. Moving forward, uh, policy and regulatory drivers uh, that are the, uh, that uh, exist on both demand as well as at the supply side. There is uh, Rahul earlier talked about the ESO. Uh, then uh, there's this mandatory five percent ESS participation. Uh, Anjali uh, uh, talked about the ISTS waivers, uh, the VGF, uh, uh, also uh, the REIAs have come up with uh, uh, guide, uh, for competitive bidding guidelines. Uh, BESS is allowed in uh, to participate in secondary and tertiary ancillary markets. And uh, as mentioned earlier, energy storage has been identified in, as a champion sector and included in the harmonized group of infrastructure. Also, a separate policy to promote uh, pumped hydro uh, has been announced in uh, this year's uh, budget and a draft has already been shared by MOP. Moving on to the uh, supply side, uh, we heard about the PLI scheme uh, of uh, ACC battery. Also, uh, there's this uh, uh, critical uh, raw uh, element, uh, raw minerals auction uh, that's happening. Uh, there is a PLI scheme for uh, raw mineral mining. Uh, various state governments have come up with incentives and subsidies. Uh, there is an uh, exemption of customs duty in uh, uh, critical minerals uh, mission. Uh, and uh, uh, ministry has also a plan to design a, a PLI scheme for battery recycling to boost the overall uh, circularity. This uh, has resulted in the growth in market opportunity, which uh, we will uh, see. So what are the various uh, tender types? One, we are talking about peak shifting. Second, we are talking about RE, RTC. Uh, third, we are talking about uh, firm and dispatchable RE. And uh, then there is this uh, standalone ESS uh, portion. While uh, there are certain challenges in all the uh, four elements, but we, the very fact that the intermittent nature of RE uh, will only be uh, uh, by supplemented by uh, uh, ESS has uh, resulted in this uh, explosive growth. Now, if we look at uh, some numbers up to 2022, we are looking at a seven gigawatt hour uh, of uh, tenders uh, being out, which uh, has already increased to 50 gigawatt hour in uh, 2024. Moving on, we will see how uh, BESS uh, standalone tenders have uh, uh, literally uh, gone through the roof from a 0 0.04 gigawatt hour in 2022, we are already talking about 9.54 gigawatt hour uh, by uh, August earlier this year. S uh, similarly, FDRE tenders uh, from a 1.5 gigawatt uh, hour, uh, 1.5 gigawatt in 2023, we are looking at 16.4 gigawatt hour uh, within uh, a year or so. So, uh, now, if we look at uh, how the tariffs have uh, gone down and thereby uh, improved the acceptability of uh, such solutions by the end of takers, we are looking at uh, a reduction right from uh, 11.25 uh, rupees to about uh, 3.81. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, the acceptability has uh, gone through the roof. So. Every uh, element of the value chain uh, is uh, coming in sync or is fitting to uh, move this entire uh, uh, driver into the next orbital growth. 
the, if we look at uh, the tariff trends of RTC and FDRE, we will uh, look at we will see a five and a half. I mean, somewhere between a three and a half to five and a half, depending on uh, different uh, tender types and tender specifications. Now, talking about uh, future opportunities, these are the broad uh, seven areas where uh, we can look at uh, uh, opportunities for ESS. Number one, grid stability and flexibility, which is essential for enhancing the demand fulfillment ratio. Uh, number two, green hydrogen, uh, ensuring reliable operation of electrolyzer. Uh, uh, I'll also uh, add on uh, the green ammonia part, uh, which Anjali had mentioned, uh, commercial and industrial applications, uh, reducing peak demand charges, backup power for critical operations, rural electrification, which is the uh, solution uh, for remote and off-grid areas, and uh, the social impact being empowering communities, export potential, manufacturing batteries and storage systems for uh, the global market and positioning India as an ESS uh, manufacturing hub. Government policies uh, and initiatives uh, are already in place, uh, albeit with certain hiccups, uh, which uh, Rahul mentioned earlier, but we are uh, extremely hopeful that they uh, will uh, certainly be streamlined and uh, aid or enable in uh, the further growth of uh, such market uh, uh, sector growth. And uh, we do see immense uh, interest from uh, institutional marquee investors uh, in uh, this particular uh, segment of the overall uh, decarbonization framework. So uh, with that, I hand it over to Sheetal and uh, would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, your slides were not moving, so I think our participants missed on. Oh, okay. No worries. Hope hopefully we can send it across to them later. Certainly, but... certainly. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, now we move ahead to the Q and A uh, section of the webinar. I request the participants to please uh, post their questions in the chat. And please, uh, I would request you to uh, write as well who they are directed to. The Q&A is open. Please post your questions. Hi, Sheetal. A couple of questions I already answered, but uh, should we repeat those uh, for the benefit of others? or? Uh, sure, so we can do that, but uh, I think some few people might be writing their questions in. Sure, Me sure. Meanwhile, I'd request all my uh, esteemed panelists to please uh, open their mics uh, and, sorry, uh, their cameras for, for a minute or two, please. So, Shrital, Amit uh, Roy had asked me a question about uh, India does not have the raw material. So, can India really get to gigawatt hour manufacturing? Uh, so, I've answered it. But basically, even China does not have most of the raw materials for which they make the batteries. So, China gets the raw materials from around the globe, processes those, and then makes the batteries. India needs to do the same. Um, uh, so India has very strong partnerships with uh, Australia, with South Africa, as well as Indian government has created a separate company called Kabil, specifically for exploring minerals for uh, both EV and battery manufacturing. And uh, they have already signed partnerships with uh, Argentina, Bolivia and other countries who have the minerals. So the key thing what we need to focus now on is uh, scaling up the uh, chemical uh, processing industry and that's where India has a very strong capability and we have been pleasantly surprised that India has uh, already more than 50 companies uh, have uh, gone ahead and invested in the supply chain for anode, cathode, uh, electrolyte, separator and other areas and that's actually one of the fastest growing um, the investment uh, within the energy storage uh, sector in India. Uh, while there are 10 plus gigafactories are also getting built, but the supply chain side, there are 50 plus companies who are uh, investing in that. And we are very confident that uh, we can not just develop the supply chain for the Indian gigafactories, 
but India can also actually support and export to other friendly countries like UK and uh, help uh, them as well uh, by building this uh, ecosystem. Yes, uh, I think Dr. Asmata Marathe uh, has a question uh, she has raised. Uh -huh. Dr. Asmata, you can please switch on your mic and ask the question. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. You can hold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question was mainly how about the waste which is getting generated after the battery life is over? Sure. So uh, I can answer from the IESA side. So IESA already since 2019 has an initiative called IRRI, India Reuse and Recycling Initiative, where both for EV as well as for stationary batteries, we are focusing on the uh, building the recycling ecosystem. But especially for the EV batteries, we are also looking at uh, secondary usage in a safe manner. Uh, so we are working with agencies like UL, uh, Bureau of Indian Standards to make sure that India does not end up becoming a dumping ground for second life batteries, but we can actually develop a robust ecosystem around that. And there are already more than 15 companies in India who are investing into setting up the recycling framework. In fact, right now, India has to import the uh, black mass for uh, processing uh, because uh, some of these deployments in India had just started and many of these batteries will have uh, somewhere around uh, uh, five to ten years of life uh, in its first use. So the actual recycling volume will scale up in India only after 2030. Uh, but already there are uh, uh, 15 plus companies, uh, including likes of Loham, Rubamain, uh, and others who have uh, started uh, investing in setting up this infrastructure in India. So we don't expect any significant issue in recycling. In general, even lead acid batteries around the globe have shown the path. Uh, globally, lead acid batteries has uh, more than 98% recycling. Uh, even in India, you may be familiar that whenever you um, replace a battery, usually the vendor itself uh, collects the batteries. Um, uh, Ministry of uh, Environment and Forest, they have already come up with updated uh, battery handling rules, uh, which take care of this. And there is an environmental, uh, there is an extended producer's uh, responsibility, which is defined. There is still some fine tuning required in terms of uh, what's the cost uh, uh, for that and other things. So uh, those fine tuning are happening and uh, we have a dedicated uh, uh, person, uh, Shreya, uh, who leads this area uh, uh, for uh, recycling. So we are paying pl very close attention to this and uh, uh, Niti Ayok also has been doing a lot of work in this area uh, in coordinating activities, especially for, for the circular economy. Another question we have uh, received in the chat box is the battery energy storage system comes in various capacities of 2R, 4R, 6R. How will this evolve in the next 5 to 10 years? And will some of the capacities be dropped as the battery manufacturing cost declines? So uh, anyone from the panel would like to shed some light on this? Yeah, so the way I see it is that uh, most of these chemistries can do longer duration, but it is more, more of a question of economics. Uh, so when lithium-ion batteries were costing more than $1,000 per kilowatt hour, people were looking at lithium-ion batteries primarily for only 15-minute uh, or 30-minute applications. As the prices started going below $1,000, started getting to $700, then it started going beyond one hour. When the prices came below $500, it started getting deployed at two-hour applications. And as the prices have come down below $300, four-hour became viable. Uh, and now we are seeing prices going down to $150 or possibly even by end of the decade getting under $100. So I think that's a benchmark which all the other technologies also have to keep in mind. Uh, because there is no technical restrictions on lithium-ion as a long-duration storage technology. In fact, uh, like most of the chemistries, lithium-ion also, if you actually uh, uh, deploy it at a slower charging or discharging rate, can have a better life. Uh, at the same time, there are certain other technologies like flow batteries, which have an inherent adv advantage that there the energy and power capacity is decoupled. So you can just build a bigger tank of electrolyte and just add more electrolyte to get... Uh, uh, longer duration but right now those technologies are still in early stages of commercialization so they have a cost disadvantage against lithium ion uh, but again um, we are quite optimistic uh, that especially uh, sodium ion 
could be one technology which can be scaled up faster since it can use similar manufacturing uh, lines as in uh, lithium ion. Uh, but then other technologies also, if they scale up in manufacturing, uh, then uh, the market is quite open. And in fact, thermal or other form of uh, storage technologies will also play a key role uh, as we start looking at longer duration storage applications. We have uh, companies who are like Energy Dome, uh, who are looking at uh, sort of a compressed air energy storage, but with uh, above ground uh, uh, sort of a uh, flexible tanks. Uh, so there are a lot of innovation happening in this area. Uh, so as the technologies get commercialized, you will start seeing more competition uh, for uh, the beyond six hour storage. Just to add on to what uh, Rahul mentioned and uh, uh, taking up a question uh, that's uh, in the chat box, uh, we also are seeing similar uh, economics in uh, the market, uh, I mean, the, the tendering uh, universe. And uh, just as uh, he mentioned that uh, 150 uh, leaning uh, further downwards towards 100, uh, uh, there's a question which uh, talks about uh, cost economics and landed rate in uh, rupees per, uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, today's day for a project to be set up, uh, let's say a 15 to 18 month uh, timeline, uh, at best 24 month timeline, uh, people are looking at a landed rate of uh, somewhere in the range of a 120. And uh, uh, talking about, I mean, if I look at standalone uh, ESS uh, as a service, uh, we recently had a GUVNL as well as a SECI tender where uh, the uh, prices are hovering close to uh, 4 lakh per megawatt per month. So, uh, yes, uh, I uh, completely concur with uh, Rahul that uh, these uh, reductions will further help in uh, proliferating uh, the acceptance and the adaptability. Thank you. Another question we have uh, in the chat box is, how do you see sodium ion technology as alternate of lithium ion in energy storage space? I mean, I think I, I can say a little bit there. Uh, I, I think yeah, potentially, you know, there's potential for it to be substantially cheaper. It's an easier, you know, resource to to uh, get hold of. Uh, I also think, you know, you know, for as long as I've been looking at storage, there's been uh, you always filled questions and discussions around kind of the resource availability of of lithium. Now, you know, there are there are many kind of studies or that, that are kind of debunked that that you know there is there is in fact enough resource, but. You know, regardless of whether there is or isn't, it is it is nevertheless the kind of at least a perceived issue. So I think again, you know, if 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 it is possible to move to to sodium iron, then yeah, there there are some kind of real benefits to to be had. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not best placed to talk about kind of you know the, the actual potential for that to happen, but I think there is yeah there, there's some real benefits if we can can realise it. Thank you, Dr. Moran. We are way past our time, so. Uh... We'll wrap up the Q&A session here. You can always uh, write to us. Uh, we'll send out the email address where you can post your questions and we'll uh, do our best possible to get back to you with answers. Uh, I'll pass over to uh, George for concluding remarks as we close the session. Over to you, George. Thanks very much, Sheetal. And uh, thanks very much to all our speakers. It's been a really uh, fascinating session this morning. Um, uh, we will uh, do our best to pull together all the slides and share the materials to all participants. Uh, and as uh, Sheetal said, if there's uh, any further questions, we'll uh, we'll attempt to pick those up as, as best we can. Um, I think today's session has just demonstrated uh, the, the pace at which things are moving, the, the massive potential that there is, um, and uh, the scope for knowledge sharing partnership uh, and uh, commercial uh, innovation collaboration between uh, the UK and India in the uh, battery energy storage space. Um, so that's really exciting. And I hope uh, this morning has, uh, and this afternoon, sorry for Indian participants, has, has whetted your appetite for that. Um, so uh, we look forward to, uh, to further collaboration and, uh, and to um, 
to uh, potential uh, collaboration coming out of this. Uh, do uh, stay with us um, uh, and look out for further materials coming out of the ITES programme. We'll be running more uh, webinars in the future, uh, which may well be of interest to many of our participants today. Uh, so thank you very much to, to everyone and um, uh, ha have a good evening, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.